Hello and welcome to Movies, Films, and Flicks. I am Mark Hoffmeyer and joining me is an absolute hormonal vulgarian, David Cross. Roar. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that a hormonal vulgarian? Oh, so I've, I've rewatched, so I've watched every one of these 10 nominees at least twice. And uh, during my rewatch of The Holdovers, which I really hope wins for best script or screenplay, it, the, the lines in that movie, like, it's just they're on fire like this. It's one of the best written movies I've watched in a long time. And there's so many great quotes and they, like, it won a BAFTA for best casting. And I totally agree with that because everyone is just perfect in it. But I've really enjoyed. So, you know, what's interesting, David, is I, I, I've watched all 10 because uh, I'm part of the Georgia Film Critics. So I want to make sure I, I've watched everything. But then we decided to do this episode. So I rewatched all 10 <laughs> uh, with Megan. She hadn't seen some of them. And I just, this, David, I know I should introduce you and, and say who you are, but David Cross, longtime member of Movie Films and Flicks. Also, he's the host of the Award Winners Movie Review Podcast, where they talk about Best Picture winners. So you're very suited for this episode. But this might be the strongest top 10 since the, the, the nominees were expanded for 2009 at the, what, 2010 Academy Awards, uh, the 82nd Academy Awards. I think this is the strongest... 10 nominees I, yeah. I truly believe that I I think that I think it's very strong this year I actually went through the last couple of years to see which ones I agreed with and I think this is this year is stronger or on par with everything up to 2019 and that's the year Parasite and um what's upon a what's upon a time in Hollywood came out and I think that year is like stellar like like there's no misses in that yeah, I mean, what, you know, 1917, Marriage Story, Little Women, Joker, Jojo Rabbit, oh. Irish, well, Irishman, I, Ford versus Ferrari. Yeah, I would, I'm going to caveat that, that Joker was an absolute miss. I hated that. <laughs> like, there's no misses, though, I don't think. And, you know, I know that you and I, we, we turned in our, we ranked, it was really hard ranking these movies. Uh, basically, for me, it comes mm -hmm. down to the top two, then the rest are, inter like, except for number 10. Like, I think we both put Maestro at number 10. And yeah. listen, it looks beautiful. And the performances are wonderful. And Carrie Mulligan, between like an education and between Promising Young Woman and Maestro, I feel like if you just put her in your movie, you're going to get nominated for Best Picture because she's incredible. But it's, I, it's just too, like, I always say biopic, but like biopic, like it's, it's just too that, if that it's makes sense. It's too Oscar bait. Let's yeah. be honest. It's Oscar. Um, this is 100% Oscar bait. Here. I, I I can't believe we're starting off with number ten. <laughs> we can work our way up, I guess. Here's the thing with Maestro: uh, it does look really good. Bradley Cooper did a lot of work on this, and he is very good in it. But I do not care at all about this movie. It took me five sittings to get through it. I I was watching this thing, and it was like paint drying. It it, it feels desperate in a way too. It feels like Bradley Cooper is really really thirsty for a Best Picture nom, uh, which he got, and. I do want to give some, you know, faint praise to this thing. It is difficult to both uh, write, produce, direct, and star in a movie. And that's why this is on here. Bradley Cooper is essentially being put on here because he did a lot of stuff to get this through. And it took five years of his life. Love the acting in it, but I I just, the script is a mess. My, I guess my issue is it just follows the beats. You know, I do think it's, it, the, the characters are round. They're not flat. They have a lot of personality. Terry Mulligan's never bad, but we've just seen this before. And I do think it took the place of maybe a more deserving movie, but it looks great. And there, but there's a couple scenes where Bradley Cooper is, is he's working as the conductor. And you're kind of thinking like, this is, I, I'm watching this. I'm like, he's directing this really making a meal of it. But you know what though? It, but I'm, I don't care. It looks good. <laughs> It does. I mean, <laughs> but a big. A I big don't like hating here. on it because it took so much work. But I think that's why it was nominated. Yeah, it took a lot of work. This is a you. This is an attaboy, really. This is an attaboy nomination. You did a you did a lot of hard work for this. You're not going to win. Yeah. <laughs> like, it, this movie might get completely shut out. It probably will get shut out. <laughs> I mean, and and listen, uh, I'm just going to read over the ten nominees real quick because I skipped over that. It's Past Lives, directed by Celine Song. The Zone of Interest, directed by Jonathan Glazer. Barbie, directed by Greta Gerwig, Oppenheimer by Christopher Nolan, American Fiction by Cord Jefferson, Poor Things by Yorgos Lanthimos, The Killers of the Flower Moon by Martin Scorsese, Maestro by Bradley Cooper, Anatomy of a Fall by Justine Triette, and The Holdovers by Alexander Payne. So these are our 10 nominees, and they're strong. 
and they all bring something very interesting. Even, you know, even Maestro, just because of how much work went into it, makes it interesting to talk about, which is nice because some movies I don't even want to discuss. But I think Maestro is good for a conversation. Yes. Yeah. I don't have a lot more, honestly, about it. Like, I just struggled <laughs> through this whole thing and I was like, I hope we gloss over it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but I, all the, the other nine that are on here belong here. They really do. And, you know, I haven't heard too much complaints this year about the nominees. Like, it's, it, I mean, we have like, there's three films directed by women that were nominated for Best Picture, which is a first. And I, I know it's 10 nominees now. You know, like, I think Core Jefferson made a great debut. It's you got like Scorsese and Nolan in here. Uh, Jonathan Glazer, who just makes art. I think Justine Triette, not a lot of people know about her, but she's been making movies that have been popping up in con for for well over a decade now. And her her French R-rated rom-coms are pretty amazing. So, I mean, Alexander Payne, he's he's no uh, he's he's been very familiar with the Academy Awards. Like this is a strong 10. Like this is. Like, imagine if this was the NBA and you had to start five and then you had the other five on the bench. Like that's like Maestro would work so hard as a sixth man. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is strong, man. I'm telling you, like this is a good year and I'm glad we're talking about it. And mm -hmm. I'm glad. And, and, you know, I'm just glad you join me. Yeah. I, so I, I've been doing this for like six or seven years with, with award winners. We're, we're a slow podcast, everyone. We only do a couple of year because it's a lot of work to give you just an idea. There's like 30 something hours worth of television for this year. And my co-host and I watch, try to watch every best picture nom. It is a lot. But what I was getting at here is that in most years, I can create a tiered list pretty easily. Like, okay, here's a top, like top, middle, bottom. I struggled with, I would say seven of these movies, like where they would fit. Yeah, on my list because they could be interchangeable and they change from day to day, literally until the yesterday. Yesterday, I I had a different movie at the top and I changed it. This like yesterday for this podcast, like well, well, well prepping. Well, wow. no, all right. So I think number three could easily be. So if I turn out a list for this, I'm not doing one through ten. I'm doing one, two, and then three will be Barbie, Oppenheimer, American Fiction, Poor Things, Anatomy of a Fall, and Holdovers. And then four will be Killers of the Flower Moon and five will be Maestro. So uh, my one and two, are you, we have the same one and two. Do David. we really? Yeah. Wow. Past Lives and as one in Zone of Interest is two. Yeah, I I love Zone, or I love Past Lives so much. So I, much. I, I, I've been putting, putting it off watching it because I wanted to watch it with my partner. And from the moment that movie start, I knew I loved it. <laughs> the the cinematography is great. The music is is wonderful. There's there's like this sort of subtlety to it. But what I think is most interesting is that it's a movie about something that's very relatable that would never get made. Like if this was a typical Hollywood script, the boyfriend would mm -hmm. be an a hole, right? And he explains uh, it in the movie too. Like I'd yeah. be this guy. Yeah, exa exactly. And it the. The performances are very powerful. I I just absolutely love this movie. And I, I walked away, like when you turned it off, just feeling, I don't, it's it's not like hope, <laughs> but it's a little bit drained, but also, but also like I've been on a ride. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I'm spent in the best way possible. And it's under two hours. And in so for the Georgia film critics, I put it, so I had Greta Lee, I had Tao Yu, I had John Magaro, uh, Magaro, like I, I had Past Lives number one, Celine Song up there and it took runner up to Oppenheimer. So that's pretty good. At least we got past lies a runner up to the steamrolling like behemoth that is Oppenheimer, but just yeah. watching it again, the chemistry and there's nothing, you know, what's interesting is there's nothing precious about it. Like after sun, like some of these moments could have very much so felt like, like a maestro. <laughs> um, sorry, but it, it could have felt very indie, very first time director, very, in love with the work, but it's so organic and so beautiful. And everyone is so good in it. And, and yeah, it's my clear number one, because I think this and zone of interest to me are art. Like I think both of these movies are art. So it's like, I, I think Barbie's beautifully manufactured Oppenheimer's a plus blockbuster filmmaking. American fiction is hilarious. Well-written 
I like great conversation piece. Poor Things is just another Yorgos triumph. The Killers of the Flower Moon is just another good Scorsese film. An Anatomy of a Fall. I mean, Justine Triette. And, and like, you know, Sandra Huller is incredible in it. And The Holdovers is beautifully written. But for me, like Past Lives and Zone of Interest are the most, they're art. Mm-hmm. Like they, that's why I have them at one and two. Yeah. Well, let's let's actually move into Zone of Interest a little bit here. And before we go any farther, do we want to spoil these? Or are we trying to keep this podcast spoiler free? Let's keep it spoiler free. Um, because, well, Zone of Interest, you can't really spoil, right? Because it's just- a, yeah. A dispassionate yes. look at these people, you know, like the these Germans who live outside of Auschwitz and it's they're living their lives while smokestacks and bodies and, you know, the charred remains of humans get into a lake. And it's yeah. it's horrifying. And I still think it should have been nominated for best cinematography because without the cinematography that makes it feel very dispassionate and very slice of life it wouldn't work mm-hmm. and so the decisions made for the cinematography i think should have been honored but they weren't it's cool because oppenheimer is going to win and they developed a new brand of kodak film and use imax cameras and lenses that had an insane depth of field which and hoyt van hoyt is great but i think it should have been nominated for best cinematography yeah. So my experience with Zone of Interest is I was absolute dreading watching it. I didn't know a lot about it. And my main thing is, is I've seen a lot of World War II movies. I feel like one comes out every year. I I bet one does come out every single year. And I was like, I just don't want to see another Oscar nominated World War II movie. I I can't handle it. But then I sat down to watch it and I was mesmerized from moment one all the way through. It's a really good study about the, the, the banality of cruelty. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Everything in this movie, you're following the, these the Nazi commander of Auschwitz. They're just their family, and how they're absolutely oblivious to everything happening around them, and all the everything's happening in the background. Like you said, there's like flames in the background, there's smoke in the background, there's people being shot in the background, but you're within a garden most of the time inside this really defined house. Mm. And there's also really interesting cinematography going on here just the sit directing decisions i don't want to spoil them for anyone but it's it's not just a straight like all in the past there's like unique um uh exposures i guess i would say yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a little bit of schindler's list in it uh <laughs> yeah i mean there's uh, no there's no ray fines in this movie yeah you know there's no there's no hans landa like the the the, the guy who the mass murderer in this movie there's a scene where all these bodies are floating in a river and he pulls up a jawbone and he quickly grabs his children, puts them in a canoe and, and leads them back through gross water. So they don't get human remains on them. It's a very, uh, it's, it's a horrifying movie, but yeah, it's, it's also art. It, it, yeah. it, yeah. And like you said, like, were you thinking this might be another sort of, not like a torture porn movie, but like a, it just, uh, were you thinking it was going to be that? I, I just thought it was going to be a lot of, um, how do I put it? So I just didn't know what it was about because I didn't bother looking at it because it was a World War II movie. And what I mean by that is like, oh, this is going to be another, uh, people are going to survive World War II and all the struggles and it's going to be about the the characters within it. And don't get me wrong, those stories need to be told and they have been told. But I personally have just, they're, they're difficult. I've seen a lot of them. So I, I thought it was going to focus on, you know, the prisoners. And it didn't. It focused on the, the 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 frankly the Nazis. And then when I heard it was focusing on the Nazis, I was like, oh great, we're gonna whitewash these Nazis. We're gonna they're gonna be like have redeeming qualities. And no, they don't. They should never have redeeming qualities. But then I started watching it. And I was like, oh, 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 this is something completely different. And it's absolutely worth my time. You know, Jonathan Glazer's pretty amazing because he'll do like sexy beast, right? Which is one of the mm-hmm. best Ben Kingsley performances I've ever seen. He'll do birth where Nicole Kidman is convinced that her dead husband is a 10-year-old boy. He'll do Under the Skin, which is one of the most beautiful movies of this decade, but it's just a lot of naked Scarlett Johansson. So if you recommend it, you're like, hey, guys, go watch Under the Skin. They're like, I know why you like that movie, Mark. It's like, no, I. it's beautiful. It's an incredible film. It's like he does tackle some really interesting movies that if you explain them to someone, they're like, why do you like this stuff, Mark? But he, he does it so expertly. Uh, expertly. And, and I think this is just another another movie that is that. Yeah, it's it walks such a tightrope, like, doesn't it? Like, yeah, either way, you're off this thing. 
and he somehow nailed the landing and i i dig it and but there's some horrifying moments when they're digging through fur coats and they're like oh i found a ring and you're just and they're grubbing through clothes you're it's <laughs> it's mortifying but it's so matter of fact but that's why it's mortifying and that's yeah. why it's art it's it's a horror movie i i, I legitimately yeah. think it's a horror movie yeah 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 and it because but you know what yeah it is it is definitely a horror movie and whew. so yeah uh, i mean past lives zone of interest they're they're, they're my one and two and they aren't gonna win yeah you know, do you want to hear the odds right now from gold derby i mean i they're low i mean i i to be really honest here oppenheimer's gonna win this the best yeah. picture like there there's no question in my mind it won the baftas they those correlate really well not always but the majority of the time if this thing's unstoppable it's gonna be oppenheimer and, and so so right now it's past lives at 10 maestro at nine zone of interest at eight american fiction at seven barbie at six killers of the flower moon at five anatomy of a fall at four poor things three holdovers two oppenheimer one but oppenheimer was the top choice by five thousand and three hundred and four critics who are part of gold derby like holdovers only had 91 poor things had 108 maestro had four the past it's lives had 10 this is probably bradley cooper yeah and and <laughs> <laughs> but 5304 by our picking oppenheimer and listen i i've watched oppenheimer three times i i went to a press screening that was completely packed and nobody moved for three hours nobody moved then i went and saw it on imax with my wife no one in that theater, packed theater, moved. And then in pre preparing for it for an episode with Niall Moore that'll come out after this, I watched it again and I learned more about it. They shot Oppenheimer in 55 days, cost under $100 million. The As soon as I saw how good the ensemble was, I'm like, well, the ensemble is going to, this is going to win every ensemble award. And it has. It is, it's a really interesting big budget film, David, because you could like, I think past lives builds to a beautiful ending. The thing about Oppenheimer is it builds to a great ending, but it's, it's a three hour movie, but, and it, and it pays to watch it all. But a lot of people don't have the time. Like Niall said, he, in the rewatching, he watched it on three different airplanes and he was totally into it all three times when he was watching it. This is a movie that you can watch an hour, go back, watch another hour, go back, watch another hour, or you can watch on a giant screen and immerse yourself. Like it's, it made almost a billion dollars. So it's one of these, art films like John Waters put on his top 10 and he rarely does that when he puts a big budget movie, but he said, it's just people talking and not, it almost made a billion dollars. So I think, you know, around the industry, people really respect Oppenheimer and it's not like a green book situation. It's not like any of these situations. It's, it's a very good movie. And, you know, as much as I prefer past lives, and zone of interest, I think Oppenheimer is a worthy winner if it does win. It, it it is. It is a worthy winner. My general thinking on Oppenheimer is that it's 100 percent Nolan film. And what I mean by that is <laughs> so that much Nolan, time. <laughs> no, yes, time you it's so timey wimey at the end. Non yes, exactly nonlinear. I think of Nolan as a technician. This is a technician story, and he all he's also really good at telling thrillers. So this is a sort of a biopic and a thriller from a great technician, someone who's really interested in just the mechanics of storytelling. And what I mean, what I mean by like, it's put into a thriller is that the structure itself has like the massive reveal. It, it holds off telling you information into the last moment. The music carries everything through at the end. It, it does feel kind of actiony. And you're right. It's just people talking with one explosion in it. <laughs> right? Like it's, and, and I love that you said that. And also, I think Nolan does a good job with what Lud Ludwig, uh, Ludwig Gorenson, the composer, where he, he said he Trojan horse some genres. It's a putting together a team movie. It's a court drama. It's a thriller. It's a horror film. It's it's somewhat of a a, 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 bi a biopic biopic. I always mess those words up. I never get I think right. it's the same. Yeah. And and but like this could have been Maestro, right? This could have been exactly. This could have been Beautiful Mind, which also won, but it's not. It's a nonlinear, beautifully filmed movie with Robert Downey Jr. doing incredible work, Alden Ehrenreich, Josh Hart, you know, every single actor. I, I, I listened to all the interviews. I read all the articles and every supporting actor in this movie, they, they joined in for, for Nolan. This movie only shot for 55 days so he could get whoever he wanted because they're like, I'll be there for two weeks. I don't, I don't care. And, and what's nice about it is they all understood that it's 
Oppenheimer's movie. It is his movie, and it's also RDJ's, but you know what I mean. They all understood that their roles weren't to take away or to distract from Oppenheimer or RDJ. And so they're part of like this tapestry or, or you know, like Damon said that he was part of this, this like a uh, huge ensemble, but they all understood their roles in it. And it's such like, it's, it, it speaks so highly of Nolan that everyone thought that way. <laughs> and it, it, it does. It really, I hope there's no backlash against Oppenheimer. I know people don't like it because it doesn't show the aftermath of the bomb. But that's not the story. And so that this is the story. And it's the story of Oppenheimer. Like Niall was saying that many scientists were left out of this movie. But this movie isn't about those other scientists. It's about Oppenheimer. And so for what it is, a movie about Oppenheimer, he did it beautifully. So I just hope there's no backlash about it. There's always a backlash against the best picture winner, no matter what it is. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter. It always, it always was, especially in today when everyone thinks they're a critic. Hey, you and I are doing this too. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Here, here's the thing with Oppenheimer. We're talking strictly by the books why this is going to win. I'm going to run through it because, because you need to realize something about the Oscars or the audience should, especially for best picture. It's both a recognition of superior achievement in film, but can also be a recognition of your career. Um, one second, Mark. I got to get him out of here all right i'll start over from um people what people need to recognize about the movie oh, all right okay. just give it a few seconds i'll jump into it okay so what people need to understand about the oscars are, and talk about strictly the uh um uh, uh the mechanics of the award is that it is both a rec- recognition of a superior achievement in film but also it can be a reward for someone's career like there, it's not a, it's not like one or the other. It's a sliding scale. So we talk about Oppenheimer. You have Christopher Nolan, who uh, was, I mean, famously uh, snubbed for The Dark Knight. Right. Mm-hmm. That's a movie that should have won. It's a fantastic movie. He does fantastic work. And then you have R. D. J. Also, a fantastic actor, has not won. Also snubbed for Chaplin. So there's two major influences in Hollywood who've been snubbed in this film or in a movie that is very very good they are both going to win they this that is one of the things that elevates this movie above the other ones they have a great story about them the other one is uh cillian murphy or killian murphy he's been around a long time and people really really like him and he has done some leading man work you know red eye but this is showcasing him in the perfect role right like i was thinking about other actors who could do this uh Mm -hmm. there's obviously they can but you needed a very erudite actor someone who can come off as not actiony but like i i just brainy and, and aloof and he nails it nails it completely so it's just this is things is going to win it deserves the win i totally get it but there's a lot of other factors playing into it i, th- I think best actor right now is down to giamatti and murphy which is correct and the pr- the thing about murphy's role and killian murphy's role in oppenheimer is you never feel the acting now other movies, you know, like Walk the Line, I don't I keep bringing up Array or or Beautiful Mind. You feel the acting. You really do. You feel it. This one, he inhabits the character so fully that even though he is an actor I've been watching for over two decades, you you start thinking of him as Oppenheimer. And he mm-hmm. does the same thing in Peaky Blinders, too. Watching his character in Peaky Blinders, I legitimately feel like he's one of the, there's only a handful of characters that I believe could be doing what they're doing on screen. And one was Russell Crowe in Gladiator. I I was like, yeah, he would just kill everyone there. That's fine. Like I was completely on board with what he was doing in that movie. But in Peaky Blinders, I was like, yes, I am afraid of him. He is perfection in this role and he inhabits that. So I think... You know, it's just it's such a credit to to Murphy for not choosing to go big, not choosing to go grand, but choosing to instead inhabit a character and be in that headspace. So it's but then also I think Giamatti could win best actor, but the script is so good. Like it's such Mm -hmm. like, but is the script as good without Giamatti saying the lines or Payne directing it? So it's it's like. Who had more to do? And I think Giamatti was snubbed for sideways. Absolutely. But I 
do you think the the inhab the way that Oppenheimer is inhabited by Murthy puts him as the favorite? Mm-hmm. At least that's just my thoughts because he doesn't yeah. have some of the greatest lines spoken of the last ten years, like Giamatti says in Holdovers. Yeah, yeah. This is one where I don't know. So the Oscars like to spread things out. They don't because this is in some way this is a lot of friends voting for friends. Uh, a lot of people who have interest in the movies voting for their own movies, trying to get the Oscar bump. So yeah, this is the the one of the categories I'm actually not sure of. I I think I do think uh, Kelly Murphy's probably going to pull it out, but uh, Giamatti has a puncher's chance, 100 percent of taking it, taking the best actor award. It, it, I think it depends on which movie you watch recently. I I on truly, I, I think if you just watch Oppenheimer, you're going to vote for Murphy. But if you just watched Holdovers. Like after watching Holdovers, there's 100% no, like, so if someone said, Mark, three minutes after you've watched Holdovers, who's better, Giamatti or Murphy? I'd be like, Giamatti. But after watching Oppenheimer, I'd be like, oh, Murphy. So (laughs) when you get some distance from those, you're like, shit, because (laughs) I don't don't know who should win. It's, it's, yeah, it's crazy. But that's how good they are. And that's how good the movies are. Mm -hmm. So it's, man, this is fun, David. I'm having a good time. Yeah. (laughs) I, um, I you're, we're in the playground, right? Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This is awesome. Uh, and- I, I did want to mention one more thing before we move too far off of Oppenheimer. It's something I forgot to mention. We're talking about uh, RDJ. So yeah, he was snubbed for Chaplin, right? He's also been snubbed for Iron Man. I I, I know I'm not like the biggest fan of superhero movies. Uh, more recently, I, I was a really big fan of him for a long time. But the idea that he didn't get any nomination for Iron Man, he would roll that he was perfect casting. Is annoying. It's really annoying, especially considering that you know Johnny Depp got it for for yeah um, Captain Jack, Captain Jack, yeah. And, and even recently, RDJ came like talked about. It. He's like I, he's like I think some of my best work has been overlooked because of the genre. And I'm like, yeah, it has. It absolutely has. Like again, I have my problems with superhero movies, and there's definitely superhero fatigue going on. But Robert Downey Jr. is not one of them. Do you know why there's superhero fatigue going on? Because there's a million of them every. Oh, no, because of RDJ and Christopher Nolan. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, look at 2008, right? And and listen, Robert Downey Jr.'s casting as Iron Man will go down as one of, I'm going to say, I'm not even doing uh, using hyperbole here. It will go down as one of the greatest casting decisions of all time, financially, culturally. I mean, yeah, financially and culturally, it will be one of the greatest casting decisions ever. Because when I, when everyone watched Robert Downey Jr. in 2008 and Iron Man, they immediately fell in love with him. And I mean, he's the reason why Iron Man 3 made a billion dollars. Like he is, he is part of the reason why we have superhero fatigue. Because you, you know, like remember Spider-Man, uh, Spider-Man mm-hmm. Homecoming, just put RDJ in it. And he's incredible in his 10 minutes in the movie. He inhabits the character you know, I got to see him act on set, which was awesome in a couple of the movies. So that was awesome to see him at work and just just see how he, uh, I know I threw that in there, but it was just kind of cool to, to, to it's watch. It's really cool. I didn't know you got that. You did. Yeah, on Civil War and uh, Spider-Man Homecoming. So I got to see, like, uh, yeah, when he's at that wedding, I was there for that day and then a lot of Civil War. So it was pretty cool. And it, it just, he is, listen, he should have been nominated. And you, I think we, I don't know if our culture's changing, but we, it, but I mean, if, if you look historically, horror movies, superhero movies, they are overlooked. So it's, you know, it's, just, it was 08 too. Like you're not going to get nominated for that, but maybe he should have been nominated for Infinity War, right? Maybe he should have been nominated for Endgame as a, or Doolittle. No, I'm joking. As a, I don't know, <laughs> I a victory lap movie. for him. But yeah, it's, it's one of the best casting decisions ever. And he's yeah. wonderful in Oppenheimer, man. He, he is, you know, he's, he's like Machiavellian stuff and he's he's devious and you like him, but then you don't like him. And he's just wonderful in it. And he's such a presence and he's so smart. He could, you know, what's interesting Like in Oppenheimer. He's simultaneously eight steps ahead of people, but he's also eight steps behind. And that's a really hard role to play. And he does it. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't think you'd have as big a role in that movie as he did. Sometimes I wonder if. Nolan was like, man, he's got a hot hand. Like, I'm gonna give, <laughs> I'm gonna give him extra <laughs> stuff to do. But oh, man. all right, so we've talked about Oppenheimer, we've talked mm-hmm. about Zone of Interest, Maestro, and Past Lives. Where do you want to go next? What do you want to cover? I, we have, like, yeah, what do you, what, what do you want? I think we should talk about. I think the order should be Killer of Flower Moons and then Poor Things. Okay, and that's because I think 
those two movies are probably the next up, the interchangeable ones, depending on how you think about movies. Uh, for me, I struggled with Oppenheimer and Killers of the Moon. They kept being flip-flopped in my head back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until I locked the list on Oppenheimer higher. And so what I like about Killers of Flower Moon is is top-notch cinematography, again, top-notch acting, a really complicated character. It's enjoyable to watch. So the things that I, I kind of struggled with that movie is like, it's probably 20 minutes too long. Not probably. Uh, yeah, okay, uh... it is. It is probably 20, 20 minutes too long. Um, and then they, they really linger on violence in a way that, that is off-putting though i understand what i understand what marty's doing here he's like he's like showing you the violence so you understand this was what's really happening like like not shying away from it but it's just so much blood and many times i was looking away from the screen and I'm, i have a pretty st strong stomach and then strangely i don't know what to make of the epilogue in this movie that's like oh this is a really interesting way to do it also why is it here <laughs> mm, <laughs> but i don't want to yeah. get too far into that because we'd be spoiling it I mean, listen, he was given $200 million to do whatever he wanted. Marty was. I love how we call him Marty. So I think he did whatever he wanted. And it's mm -hmm. it's a very interesting choice. And, and what you said about the violence, I think what he did with the violence was very smart because none of it should be pretty. None of it should be glorified. It shouldn't be John Wick, right? It shouldn't be Casino. It shouldn't be Goodfellas. It shouldn't be gangs of New York. It should be the ugliest violence perpetrated by some gigantic dipshits. You know, like the people that do some of the killing in this movie, they're idiots. They're just I mean, yeah. pawns. And, and I think that's why this movie is quite scary because you realize that De Niro came in there and wrecked havoc on the Osage by like just a bunch of idiots did it. And it, it makes it even sadder that, you know, the laws in our country were what they were. And it, it, I think the violence was necessary, but I guess my problem with the movie is I just haven't thought about it. It has not lingered in my memory and every, I've watched it twice and I've loved it both times I watched it, but it just, it, it, I haven't been walking along the street and just thought about killers of the flower moon. And yeah. I, I don't know why, but it, every, the craft is great. It had $200 million. I, I just, I think it tackled it in an interesting way. I know there's been a lot of complaints, I mean, Gladstone has spoken up about it. Scorsese has spoken up about it. I understand why they did it, but I don't know. It's it's not a movie that's lingered in my memory. So that's yeah. why I don't have it high up on my list. Can, can you expand on the complaints just so the audience knows? Well, you know, they're, they're saying, you know, some people spoke out about it again, saying it should have been from the Osage perspective. And, you know, this is based on Killers of the Flower Moon. It's based on a book that Scorsese loved. And I think it's important for him like they, they think it should have given more representation to the Osage nation, which I agree with. I just think this movie is quite powerful knowing the idiots who did this to them and the law, like, you know, you're not, you're just showing how horrible it was. You're showing who did it. Like you're, you're, I, I don't know. So you either go one or the other, you can't just flip flop between both of them. And for me, I think Scorsese's always been interested in the villains in cinema. I mean, if you look at Goodfella, Casino, Taxi Driver, you know, Mean Streets, he, he's always been he's always been into departed, the the moral gray area. So I don't I don't think he wanted to do that. I think he chose to tell it from the perspective of DiCaprio, who's an idiot. The guy, he's an idiot. And I think that's why it's effective, but the, the complaints were that didn't give enough representation. And mm. I, I understand that completely, but I think you just have to think about the movie a little bit and not just go with your gut on it. You have to kind of consider all the angles and why it was made. So that that's, mm. I don't know, that, that's my thoughts on it, but that was the complaint. I don't know if you felt the same way. E yes, I've had that thought as well. I started off where you were at like, yeah, why is this told from those sages point of view? And I had the exact same roller coaster that you just went through. <laughs> like, 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 I did the exact same thing. I was like, oh, I got to think about who this director is and what he's trying to do. And it's it's highlighting the violence violence by a specific group. Like, it makes sense. I mean, but the on the other side, like, we don't get enough, you know, representation for the Osage and other types of movies, right? No, no, absolutely right? not. It's, it's a joke. Yeah. And so I think people are just tired of 
the lack of representation and they kind of see this movie and who was the star and they kind of put that together. But I do think it's, I, I think Lily Gladstone had some interesting things to say. Like she said, like wh- how she spoke ab- about this movie and she's like, a lot of people are traumatized by the pain inflicted upon you know, Native Americans in cinema and, and that reaction's totally natural. It's just not that movie. And, but I don't think, I don't know. I don't think this is, you know, Goodfellas, right? Has sat in my brain for years because Goodfellas, it really drags you to hell in a way. This movie, I don't think really drags you to that place. It's very, it's kind of dispassionate in a way, but it's technically sound. The performances are great. You know, I, I think Lily Gladstone is, is really good in it. You know, I think it, more people go watch an unknown country because of that. Cause, cause she's in that movie and it's really good. But yeah, I just, I, I, it's not, it's not going to win and it's not top tier for me in this category. Yeah, I, I get that. So I guess this discussion, we should probably move into like best actress because we're talking about Lily Gladstone. So from, from my understanding, looking at all the other previous awards, it, it seems like Emma Stone's going to take away, take this away. Yeah. And I think justifiably, because I do yeah. Lily Gladstone's great, but you know, I, I think for like a third of the movie, she's sidelined. She really is. She is poisoned and in and in bed from DiCaprio. And and what she does in the movie is great. And she should have won all the awards that she has, and she should be nominated. But if you look at poor things and Emma Stone's uh, physicality, her line readings, her cadence, her growth as a character, like I'm gonna go punch that baby now. Her dancing, like it's a brave role. I, I brave. I don't, p- people say you shouldn't say brave, but like it's a very trusting role in the director, and she she puts everything out there, and it it's it's a kind of a it, it is the deserved front runner. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It's a good time to talk about poor things too. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and listen, like I, I think Sandra Huller should be in the conversation as well for best actress because of her work in zone of interest and anatomy of a fall uh you know if you look at who had the best two punch like one two punch it's her like her body language is completely different in zone of interest than it is in anatomy of a fall the way she moves the way she walks so i i think it's a three i think it's a race between three people but i do think emma stone's got it yeah, I I agree too. I have not seen Nyad, so I can't say much. And oh, then, it's good. It's good. Maestro, like again, like Carrie Mulligan's in it. She does a good job. <laughs> She's a professional. <laughs> but that's like all I can say about that movie. Yeah, yeah. I don't want people to think I'm hating on Maestro. It's just, it's just so Maestro-y. I don't, I don't know. It's a weird. I have a very weird relationship with that movie. You, you can you you could say I hate on it. How about that? Okay. You don't have to say it. I'll say it. <laughs> all right. But there, there's nothing to hate, though. It's just maestro. I don't, I don't it's know. Just, and it's just bland. It's bland. It's, but I know some people who loved it. So I don't like hating on it because some people definitely find a lot of things to love in it. I just, I don't know. I just, I guess I'm going for past life. It, for me, it's all about, I keep saying it, but past lives and zone of interest. But, mm-hmm. and, but I mean, if you look at poor things, the humor in it, the, I mean, Mark Ruffalo is unhinged and hilarious. Willem Dafoe, you, I have a question for you. So, I've watched all of your ghost movies and, and so when I watch poor things, people are walking out of it. Some of the, like I was, I was at another screening for it and I was leaving and people are like, man, that's a weird movie. I'm like, is it a weird movie or is it a your ghost movie? Or does like, I don't, for me, it wasn't weird because I'm like, I'm watching your ghost on Demos make a movie. So it never read to me as being out of place because I knew the director. So is that just me being a movie snob or is it, or is it an it, odd movie? It <laughs> interesting. It is an odd movie compared to the favorite and the killing of a sacred deer. But probably even to lobster, honestly. <laughs> but it's still within his realm, right? Like you know, this director is going to do some odd stuff. Make in this, this is it. Like it kind of feels like a culmination of those other movies, like building up to this. I just like dog tooth, and you know, like the lobster, the dog killing scene, and the jacuzzi scene. And then you have Killing of a Sacred Deer, everything Barry Keoghan does, everything Nicole Kibben does, the line delivery in that movie, those are all far more or less commercial than Poor Things. So I guess for me, I was like, Poor Things probably is most commercial movie. So I guess I never looked at it as being weird, quote, quote unquote weird. I just looked at it as being like a Yorgos movie. That's probably his most commercial one. 
it's I, don't, I have a weird thing but maybe it's just because I, i've watched so many movies that i feel that way but i mean the movie also looks great like the costume design is gorgeous the mm -hmm. world is wonderful the performances are unhinged and yeah i don't know it's, it's yeah the one thing i would say I, I i left the movie thinking who are the poor things like I definitely have an opinion on that. And if I told everyone it would spoil it, and I could tell you offline, Mark. Uh, but if anyone reads this and then listen to this podcast, contact one of us and give us your thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it's uh, but like they just all the characters are on fire. The acting's good, the world's great. And if it won Best Picture, I wouldn't mind. Like I think everything about it's top notch. It just it's up against Oppenheimer. So I don't think it will win. But yeah. I, I think Emma Stone will win. Mm -hmm. I think if this if Poor Things won Best Picture, there would be a, a bigger uproar than um, Oppenheimer. Yeah, because listen, the res but it's not going to happen. Like I really, no, it's not. Like I, I wouldn't put the house on it, but it's not going to happen. Like Oppenheimer is going to win for sure. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. I've watched Poor Things twice, and I love it. Megan loves it. Like I. She was just, she just adored the movie and it, it's, it's good for conversations too. And I, I just think it's funny, like Mark Ruffalo getting punched in the belly. I could just watch that every day. It's, it's incredible. Are you, uh, are you telling me this movie is very much like under the skin? You know, that's why you like it. Oh gosh. <laughs> yeah. I, it is that kind of movie. If you tell hey, go watch, Hey guys, go watch poor things. It's wonderful. And they're like, Mark, why'd you tell me to watch that? So it's, but you know, but you know what though, the way they, handle everything this movie it doesn't feel exploitative exploitative it feels very confident and i mm -hmm. think that's the yeah. mark of a good movie it's not an 80s action film that just has some gratuity in there it's it's a it's a film it's a legit film so i yeah but yeah i don't know if i could recommend this to many people i no. i can't I, <laughs> I mean i like it a lot but i would give it to people sporadically <laughs> okay someone yeah. someone walks up to you and goes recommend what like what are two best picture nominees you would recommend now i don't really like movies i don't like weird things i don't like weird stuff i would say holdovers mm. and barbie interesting i would definitely do holdovers american, uh, fiction, could be good too. american fiction could be good I have a lot of thoughts on that one. Maybe I'd, I'd actually do Oppenheimer. It's really not that difficult. Yeah. Like the problem with Oppenheimer is that if you're not a moviegoer, you could get confused with Christopher Nolan's nonlinear storytelling. That's the biggest problem with that. But it is eminently watchable. And if it's the best picture and someone wants to watch a best picture, like you gotta, you gotta do a little bit of legwork with it. You gotta pay attention. You gotta put your phone down. I think holdovers might be the best to recommend. It is. I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, listen, I love poor things. It's just a your it's a bonkers Yorgos movie and I love it. So yeah. Yeah. Good old good old part. Yeah. <laughs> this movie is insane. Talking about holdovers. Okay. We we dived in this a little bit, right? We talked about um Giamani, right? I'm a little concerned that holdovers is gonna get snubbed. They're not gonna get anything. Oh no, like, Divine uh Divine Joy Randolph has it. You think, think she, she has it? Yeah, yeah, that's so I'm looking at the odds here. The she's the top choice of five thousand three hundred and fifty-five critics emily blunts the next one with 114 oh then she definitely has it yeah i mean but, like there's no one like america ferrara she's great daniel brooks is really good in color purple jody foster is incredible and in, and i added like she you, you got to see just the the sunburns of these characters in <laughs> they look like such florida people <laughs> or swimmers in niad and emily blunt's great but she has i love emily blunt but she has a moment uh, you know joy randolph yeah. has an entire movie and she is her accent, her performance, her line delivery, she is incredible in it. Like she's won every award. She won the BAFTA. I didn't she realize that. Yeah. Yeah. She's, if she loses, it'll be the biggest upset of the night. That's my thought. Yeah. From what you're saying, yes. So generally, I do like the holdovers a lot. Um, and like, I don't have a lot to say about it because like it's fun. It's funny. Uh, Paul Giamatti is great. It's a good like, like period piece. And then I'm just like, okay, like I enjoyed it. I, like it, I don't have much to think about other than outside of that. It should be studied for the script and the casting because the script is beautiful. I mean, it's one of the funniest scripts. The lines in it are some of the best lines I've heard read in a long time. And just Sessa and Joy Randolph and Giamatti, they are perfect together. 
even the extra kids, like there's the football player kid. He could have been a complete jerk, but he's like, nah, my dad wants me to cut my hair. I don't. And then his dad comes and picks him up in a helicopter. And what does he do? He takes all the other holdovers with him skiing. Like, it's so interesting. I don't know. I love that. Don't you? And the scenes yeah. with the dad and the cherry Jubilee when they go outside with the fire and learning more about Giamatti and his smells and his his everything. Like, he he's just, but you're right. There's not, you don't, there's not too many, everything is kind of tidied up at the end. So there's not too many themes to explore in the holdovers. But yeah, have you met someone who doesn't like it? No, I've not. I haven't met one person who doesn't like it. Everyone likes it. Like I know people who hate Oppenheimer. I know people who don't like Maestro. I know people who haven't liked American fiction. I know people who, uh, well, no, most people like Barbie. So it's, it's like, I know people who don't like Killers of the Flower Moon, but I've never met a holdovers hater. And that's actually something that gives it a lot of, uh, a lot of cred at the Oscars. Well, can you explain Oscar voting for best picture? Yeah, yeah. So just for best picture, um, it's ranked choice voting. So what I always tell people, it's not the most loved movie, it's the most liked movie. And what, I, what happens with ranked choice voting, essentially, if you're a member, vote from one to 10, you just order what you think's best. And then um, Price Waterhouse Cooper tabulates it and they say, okay, any movie that doesn't reach a specific threshold for is dropped. And then the members vote, we go to the next one. So the idea is that you just keep voting until one of these movies has 50 plus one percent of the vote. Uh, just keep it out there. It's ranked choice voting. That's what you really need to understand. And and so, you know, the most dev divisive movie could be number one on list and number 10 on other lists. So it won't win. But the holdover, yeah. the holdovers, it, it's it's in my top five. So if it's mm -hmm. if it's number three through five on every list or two through five on every list, it has a very good chance of winning. Mm -hmm. the, it's the uh, Green Book effect. Yeah, oh god! But this is a thousand times Green a Book, million times better. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like yeah. we're talking, like it's a billion times mm -hmm. crash. It's it's wonderful, and yeah. you know, it's never it's never overly nostalgic. It's never, man. It's just good. It pops. But you're right. There's not much to talk about. It's, just, <laughs> it's you know, there's no themes to explore, even though it's it's a lovely movie to talk about. And yeah. I mean, I will say one of the movies I've talked about most with my students is American fiction. So one of my students started writing movie reviews because of American fiction. I have another student who's watched it six times. Mm -hmm. So I, do you want to move on to American? I do. Fiction? I do. I have. I don't have like a lot of thoughts, but I find this movie extremely interesting. It's also very cynical. Very cynical. Yeah, it's like hiding its cynicism behind just laugh out loud moments. <laughs> and like when I first watched it, I'm like, this is so funny. This is so funny. How are they going to get out of this? How are they going to do What's going to happen? And at the end, I was like, oh my God, this is so cynical. <laughs> I mean, it's wildly cynical. And, but I mean, Jeffrey Wright is incredible in it. There's that scene where he names the book. He's like, eh, you know, like, eh, here's our PG-13 rating. Like, call it Fuck. And the conversations, <laughs> with so Issa, good. the conversation so good. with Issa Rae and how they vote the book to be the best book of the year. And the whole movie, I've watched it twice. I've had the biggest smile on my face. Like, I'm not quite sure why Sterling Clay Brown was nominated other than I, other than he's just great. Like, he's he just great. Seemed, I'm also confused, but he's really good in it. I, he should have been nominated for Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul, because he's a three dimensional. Like, But he's also, you know, he's like, you know, get away from this family or break your heart and just watching him dance with the mom and then leave. He does He's, you know, I don't think I've ever seen him and not been happy to see him in a movie, but I just, yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I understand why Jeffrey Wright was nominated, but then when I saw his, it was a bit surprising, but also though, I, I like how they talk about what is it? Plantation annihilation. And it's just so, this movie's so angry, but it's also so funny. Like, why is my, like, remember when he grabs his books in Barnes and Noble? He, he's just, oh, it's his so books. Good. yeah, and, uh, I, I, I don't know. I think. I think it's a movie with something to say, and I've talked about it with a lot of my students. And they've, they've, we've, chat, like, it's one of the movies I've talked about most this year with my yeah. students. So that's why I think it's a worthy contender because it's a conversation starter. And if it won, <laughs> that would be incredible. It would, would be incredible. Uh, and oh. it, right. And uh, I, uh, you know, I think Core Jefferson for a first, you know, first time feature length director. There are some writerly touches in it. There's that scenes like you've seen dead bodies. It's like, I'm a plastic surgeon. 
So I, I think there are some lines where you're like, I don't, I don't know if that works because it's very on the nose, but it's very Buffy. Yeah. And yeah, there, there it is. But like the scene on the beach with the funeral and that guy walks by, he's like, are you dumping that in the ocean? Like, it's just get out of here, Steve. <laughs> and there's some very good moments. And I, I like the conversation with Issa Rae, I thought was neat. And I don't know, it, mm-hmm. it, it very much so tackles very, not serious, but I, don't know, I think important. No, I mean, important rep- representation in media. It, it tackles that both from perspective, like both, you know, from white people and black people, but also upper class versus lower class. Like, yeah. like it's across the board. And it, and what's smart about it, it, it does. M- bring you along, bring you along. You laugh at it. You laugh at it. And then it drops a hammer in the last 10 minutes. Like, Oh, Oh, we're poking fun at you. <laughs> yeah. it, it's just very, it's, it's just a very smart movie. It's very smart. And you and I, where we come from studying communication, the way that it communicates his ideas, I think is, is brilliant. Mm-hmm. So that's why I have so much appreciation for it. Yeah. I do want to give a shout out to Jeffrey Wright. I, I really want to see more films by him. I Everything he's in, I love. He's everything. never been bad. He's always been, every time he's on screen, I'm happy. Even in uh, Westworld, when that show went off the deep end, he kept, he kept pushing. <laughs> you know what annoys me about Westworld is they probably could have gotten another season, but they're so expensive. Like that show got so expensive and it didn't have Game of Thrones numbers. So if they just would have, scaled back and cost half as much they probably could have done more but they're like no let's go to this expensive place in indonesia and shoot there yeah yeah yeah. i mean it could have had more numbers if they knew how to stage an action scene (laughs) (laughs) yeah like like, that that movie is just we're going on a sidebar here but the 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 thing with that is there was no stakes if everyone could come back at any time through any different means why kill off a character yeah that's true yeah, because you can always find their ball later. Yeah, exactly. Later. But I, I, you know, I know we got a little in depth with American fiction, but, you know, a lot of my students wanted to talk about that. They wanted to pursue it. And I just think the way that it does it is really intelligent. Yeah, so I'm, I, I'm really excited to read some some more reviews of this and retrospectives on it. it it's very good. Um, so what do we have left? We have Barbie, Barbie and Anatomy, and Anatomy of, the of the Fall. Yeah, oh, Barbie, so the big... Barbie, the big heavy hitter, like discussion point, just because of, you know, it's everywhere. It felt like it feels like it's everywhere, right? Even talking about it, I feel like a little bit like I might put my foot in my mouth, but I'm going to, I'm going to be honest because that's who, who I want to live as. I think it's a mediocre movie. It has some really, really highs and some really, really lows, and it balances out to like a five or six out of 10. Do you, do you think that's because it's a, $150 $150 million PG 13 rated movie about a toy that's also trying to. It's a movie about a toy that's going to sell toys, but it's also critical of the toys. So it couldn't be, it couldn't be laser focused like an R rated $35 million movie. It had to be, it had to sort of have messages, but it couldn't have too many messages, but then it had to be bright and shiny. It, it's a lot happening. It's a little yeah. too much in the mix. It's like getting a, getting a cookie with, you know, caramel and pretzels and chocolate chips it's just way too much and it's also i i hate i I use this word already but it is it is cynical but because it's it's an exercise in branding it's a huge exercise in branding that is being fed to us as like one of the best movies made in 2023 and it's fine like i enjoy it well enough the idea that this like this is like pinnacle no absolutely not like like I also don't agree that, you know, Margot and Greta Gerwig were snubbed. One of the things I always need to remind people is that the Best Picture Oscar goes to the producers, not the director. So they were both producers, and that means they are Oscar-nominated producers. And Greta got nominated for screenplay as exactly. well. So, exactly, exactly, yeah. And, and, and so I have a data post coming out for uh, by, by the Numbers episode coming out for fandom. I don't want to give everything away, mm-hmm. but it's going to be out in a couple of weeks, and you should go watch it. If you've listened to this podcast, because I break down the best director category in regards to to Greta Gerwig snub. So I think you're going to like it. I had right. a lot of fun working on it. But yeah, it's like, I think, Mar- listen, this movie deserves a best picture nomination. It made yeah, one, it does. one point four billion. And also, I think there's enough ideas in there that can take root in people's brains. So I think when you make a movie like this, you can't. It cannot be an absolute message movie. 
and it has to kind of incept ideas into people's brains. And I think it's smart enough to do that. And I also think Greta Gerwig and Margot Robbie were not content to sit on, just make a toy movie. They really put some interesting ideas into Barbie. And so I've actually watched it about four times now. I've listened to the commentary. It, you know, the marketing of this movie will go down as some of the greatest marketing ever. Like That's first, very true. For screenings of Avatar, The Way of Water, they added the 2001 opening. So when people were like, wait, Barbie? They're making a 2001 Stanley Kubrick reference in Barbie? So it changed people's perception of the movie. The ice, the, the roller skating, the car flips, everything was released so perfectly for this movie. And just based on its success, the, the soundtrack, the score, you know, my daughter, Mallory, I have the, the vinyl waxworks Barbie score. She gets up in the morning and she'll go to the record player and want to listen to it and dance with me. So <laughs> I dance with my two and a half year old daughter to the Barbie soundtrack in the morning and in the afternoon and at night, she loves dancing, but yeah. it's, it's, it's a movie that I think does a great job of sneaking in ideas that I think will stick with people. And I, I, mean, I like that references to West side story and all those great dance sequences from the, the fifties. Oh, I love those. And like, I, 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 I'm not, wait, I'm not a fascist. I don't control the railways <laughs> and just like, that's, there's some really funny mo and like, you know, it's, it's an all dude thing of Mattel and just the way that they talk, but he's not the ultimate villain. And I don't know. I just, it's, yeah. It, yeah. So Margot Robbie and Greta Gerwig do deserve to have the noms because they did something phenomenal with this movie and recognized by the billions of dollars they made. Right. Yeah. And so I don't, but I don't want to come off saying like, I hate this movie. I just think it's like average to slightly above average. And so Margot Robbie, very, very good. Uh, Barbie, um, Ken, or Ken, <laughs> oh my God, Ryan Gosling is a good Ken. Uh, anything that happens like in Barbie world, awesome. Most of the stuff in the outside world, I I don't like, including the car commercial in the middle of the movie. <laughs> oh yeah, there's a the Chevy, right? It's a yeah, Chevy. It, yeah, it doesn't look like it looks like someone else directed it completely. Like honestly, but it's you know I think they did that on purpose. She said she changed the look of it completely from Barbie Land to the real world. But yeah, it's I don't know it. I love it. <laughs> I do, but I don't think it's best picture winner. It, I do. I, it is going to have a longer lasting impact, I think, than almost all these other movies. Let's be honest. Oh, yeah. yeah. And yeah. and listen, like I said, these two could have, well, you know, just like American fiction, I think, just like Oppenheimer, they really, I mean, zone of interest, anatomy, of, like most of these movies found a very interesting way to tackle a subject. And they, 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 you know, the way that Barbie can communicate ideas, but then also have a dance party in bright colors and horses. It's in, in brewski beers and Mojo Jojo Casa houses. It, it just any, I, I don't know. I just think it, it did a good job of, of relaying a message by also being a, a massive corporate shelf to sell Mattel toys, which is tough to do. Yeah, yeah. Right. But there, you also need to point that out, right? Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like revitalize Barbie <laughs> and it did uh, and it, you know I, I made a joke you could buy enough Ken dolls to like travel across the United States you could lay him flat on the ground and go to all the Godfather filming locations and to a Florida horse farm with just Ken dolls if you started in, in Santa Monica that's how much move, money the movie made <laughs> it's a lot of Ken dolls <laughs> yeah uh, and then I guess we're on to Anatomy of a Fall last mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm oh. going to actually let you take this, Mark, because we have different opinions on it. I mean, listen, it's perfect. It's I think Sandra Huller is incredible. I think Justine Triette did a great job her, listening to her answer these questions about her husband. And, you know, I was talking on another podcast and there, there, there's that argument between the couple and Anatomy of a Fall. And I think sometimes the best dialogue scenes are when both people are right. The, the, the truths that they drop on each other in that conversation are very truthful the husband and wife. I think the kid is good. I, I like the lawyers in it. I think it's it's just a very interesting movie led by like Sandra Huller's performance is so subtle, but so blunt. And it's just it's just working on all cylinders. And so for me, like I know this why I know why this won the Palm Dior. Like I I I know why it's nominated for Best Picture. 
I think it's just a really good work of art. I do. I don't, I haven't really thought about it too much, but I think as far as courtroom films go, it's expertly done. For me, this movie is like, I recognize it's really good and all across the board, like, oh, this is great. And I just struggle to get through it. And the main reason is, is like, I felt it was very over, very um, uh, blunt. <laughs> like, I understand what the director is trying to do with the title and how they wanted you to consider, like, did that did the wife actually commit murder or not? And I was like, it could have been shorter. Uh, but the one thing that kept returning me to the movie is something we can agree on is the actress, the mother. She is phenomenal and deserves her best picture nom. Like, she is acting in three languages, um, at least two. Yeah. Yeah. And and I, I saw that. And I, this is the one thing that just kept sticking out in my mind. It was like, she's she's killing this in multiple languages. You know, you know how hard that is? <laughs> yeah. It's, um, yeah. I mean, just uh, what, English, French, and German. Yes. Yeah. And just bouncing back and forth between the three while she's getting lambasted by that, the, the male... <laughs> Uh, I, I can't think of the 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 lawyer. I wish I had a better term, barrister. I don't. I, but yeah, just I don't. But you know, I I just think it's good craftsmanship. I think it's it a is. good movie. It, very, it is very well put together. Again, I just thought it was a little too much. Like, like you cut it down. I get it. I mean, maybe that's the point though. It ends with well, I don't want to spoil the ending. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's a lot for me. Got it. it but you know, I think Justine Triet is really respected in the industry. I think Sandra Huller is very respected in the industry. The dog put in a great performance in the movie. The twist Excellent. and turns about poisoning the dog and what the dad said. And it's very, it's twisty and turny and very interesting. And, you know, also Megan just fell in love with it. She's, she wants the criterion. So I gotta, I gotta actually, I gotta pre-order the criterion for her. Like she loves this movie so much. And I don't know. I just think, I just think it's good that it's nominated because like, I hope I'm not butchering her name. I listen to interviews. I hope I'm saying it right, but just Justine Triette, like she's incredible. Like she's a great director. So this is really going to be a, a, an opportunity for her to continue making awesome movies. So yeah, that that's what I'm all about. It's not going to win. It's currently ranked number four, but it sh I think it should be nominated. I do. Yeah, I, I totally understand why it's nominated. I, mean, yeah. like, I don't have a problem with it on the list. Got it. Um, can I share with you my Hofsker nominations? Your Hofskers, yes. Yeah. So if, if I had to pick 10 movies to be nominated for Best Picture, it changes every day, but these are the 10 movies I want to see. Full Time, which was an, an incredible French film, probably the best ending of any movie this year. Past Lives, Asteroid City, The Zone of Interest, Polite Society, which I, I love Polite Society, Priscilla, Sisu, They Clone Tyrone, Perfect Days, which I adore, and All of Us Strangers, which has gotten completely snubbed of awards and just features wonderful performances, excellent writing, like scenes that'll floor you. So my top 10 are my Oscars would be full-time pass wise, asteroid city zone of interest, blight society, Priscilla, Sisu, they clone Tyrone, perfect days and all of us strangers. Those are my Oscar nominations. Yeah. So I don't have any, uh, Crossers. Crossers. I have a list of my favorite movies for the year, which is not necessarily the best movies. Ooh. And then also, a movie that I believe should be nominated, but it's a controversial take. So my favorite movies of the year, like straight up, I love Past Lives. It's probably my favorite movie of the year. But then we get to the genre stuff that I love. So Knock at the Cabin, yeah. I love it. Criminally underrated. Uh, the D&D movie, very funny, very enjoyable. Uh, this is one that is bad, but I I love every moment of it. And one day, I hope you and I get to cover it, Mark. The Pope's Exorcist. Oh yeah, we need to cover that. <laughs> I want I want more Russell Crowe being like old old uh, late career Russell Crowe just doing whatever he wants. And then this is odd for me. Guardians three. I think it in it's it's ends the the trilogy in a perfect note. And I I remember messaging you, Mark, right after I got done reading it. I was like watching it. I was like, oh. I would have never thought I liked it, would have liked this. And it's, it's really good. I mean, it's expert filmmaking. James Gunn knows what he's doing. Yeah. He's just uh, in my, my top 10. I, uh, sorry. I just want to read them to you. See what you think. Uh, Fist of the Condor, Past Lives, Sisu, Asteroid City, Full-Time, Polite Society, Plain, Perfect Days, Priscilla, and Blackberry. Plain. Oh, I love. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Okay. Here is my movie that I think should be nominated. My controversial take, <laughs> John Wick 4. Yeah, why and, not? Yeah. Yeah. It, it is. Drop Maestro. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah. And here's the thing. I kind of think, no, I don't kind of, I do think there should be a best stunts category at the Oscars yeah, it's, or yeah. even best choreography. And John Wick would fit into the best choreography. It would win. Hey, yeah. Yeah, it would come real close. Where like well, the the Barbie stuff's real good. The music. <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, it, but 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 John Wick is choreography and it's, it's dancing stunts. Still. It's uh, I'm annoyed. I'm annoyed by that. I think it should have been. Um, and I do think that stunt people are overlooked. I agree. And uh, hey, so I'm really glad you brought that up because I on MFF I asked MFF followers what movie will win, what should win, and what should have been nominated. Do you want to hear? Yes, absolutely. Jay Cluett said Oppenheimer, Poor Things, and Wonka should have been nominated. So he thought op- he thinks Oppenheimer will win. He thinks Poor Things should win. And he thinks Wonka should have been nominated. Justin got Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer, Across the Spider-Verse. Tony Coogan, mm-hmm. Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer, The Boy and the Heron. Ali Maxwell, Oppenheimer, American Fiction, Wonka. Zanandi, Oppenheimer. She hasn't seen all of them. And then Asteroid City. Jason Hemming said Oppenheimer, Poor Things, and Priscilla. Aaron Neuer said Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. John Wheeler, or Johnny Numb, Oppenheimer, Poor Things, Eileen. Megan Hoffmeyer, Poor Things. She, she, she thinks Poor Things will win because she loves it so much. And then she put Zone of Interest, and she thinks Perfect Days should have been nominated because Perfect Days is a perfect movie. Op, uh, David Brooke thinks Oppenheimer will win. Poor Things should win, and he thinks Love According to Dalva should have been nominated. Andy Golding says that Oppenheimer will win, Past Lives should win, and he thinks Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret should have been nominated. Lisa Skippen thinks Oppenheimer will win, and American Fiction should win. And then James Foley says Oppenheimer will win, Zone of Interest probably should, and he thinks May December should have been nominated. Interesting. A, yeah. May December is really interesting. This. Yeah. So Charles- one. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, Charles Melton not being nominated is odd because for he, which movie? Uh, May December. His supporting yeah, turn yeah. in that movie was wonderful. That is a very one. I love that movie, yeah. and I think it's also not for everyone. <laughs> like you kind of have to understand that it's shot like a lifetime movie on purpose. <laughs> yeah, and and oh, Julia Moore's accent, she's just perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh. it's very good. Uh, from what you said, the one thing I'm surprised has it had no conversation with Saltburn. People mm. either love that movie or hate that movie. It's empty as shit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it, it, it is. I mean, I that's well, that's that's aggressive for you, Mark. I never hear you say something like yeah, that. Yeah, but like it's, it is, it's, it is. <laughs> it's like Kaiser Sose. And and listen, like if I was 17, I'd probably love it, right? Because I loved intolerable cruelty. So I think there are a lot of young people who love it and the music is great. And the best moments, you know, the 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 naked dancing is 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 hilarious and the the bathtub scene with the the water drinking and there's images in it that i find to be truly memorable but it falls on its face it just it, it yeah it's just a go watch uh just go watch tell miss ripley <laughs> it <laughs> says know? nothing it really does and yeah. you know but you know what though teenagers 20 somethings don't need that they they seem to really love this movie so but for me i just I don't think it should be up for any awards consideration at all. Okay. Well, hopefully we'll see Emerald Fennell's uh, next movie and it's, you know, another step up. <laughs> like, you know, Promise Young Woman had something to say and Saltburn has nothing to say. There's no critique on rich. There's no critique on poor. Uh, it's just uh, the usual suspects. Hmm. Like a, yeah, it's like Parasite with without any substance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, Pretty much. Like, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you, right? Parasite is my favorite movie of the decade. Like I love that movie more than any other thing else. It is perfect for me. I've watched right. it multiple times and I very, very rarely watch movies more than once. Wow. And no, it's, it's beautiful. And listen, there's a reason why it's, it's in the, so let's see, Parasite, this, let's see, what am I saying? In the, let's see, since 2018, of the 2010s, it's in the top five of Letterboxd, IMDb, and rotten tomatoes and maybe metacritic like it's it's genuinely considered by critics and audiences from all over the world to be one of the best so yeah it's i agree with you uh hey do you want to do we uh, i know this is going along uh do you want to let's do a quick draft though let's pick our favorite movies nominated for best picture that didn't win since 2000 and the 82nd oscars which took place in 2010 but it celebrates 2009 movies 
So we'll take the movies that didn't win. I'll I'll let you pick first. Oh, oh, okay. There are some stacked ones in here. And I know, I know that my first pick is not optimal if I'm like, oh, I'm going to win, right? But I'm picking the movie I want on my list. That's Winner's Bone. Oh, yeah. Winner's Bone is criminally underseen. It is, um, oh my God, I just forgot her name. Jennifer Lawrence is like coming out as a, an actress. It is great. I would also read the book if you have the time. I love that movie. Yeah, it's only one of 22 Best Picture nominated films to be directed by a woman. Oh, I didn't realize that. So uh, I decided to drop that because I just worked on a post. But I'm going to say Tree of Life. Tree of Life is my... Interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's it's grown in my estimation. I think it's beautiful. It's immersive. It's wonderful. Yeah, so I'm going to take Tree of Life. I am going to take a heavy hitter here. And I think it's going to be one that's maybe on your list too, Mark. And that is Mad Max Fury Road. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I love this movie. It changed action. It's held up very well. People talk about it all the time. And I'm stoked for the prequel. Oh, yeah. I mean, listen, it was never going to win, but it deserved that nomination. And I'm glad it was. So good. Okay. I'm going to take Drive My Car. Mm, because that's a good one. I love that movie an incredible amount. Megan surprised me with the criterion because I think it's great. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to take Drive My Car because I just love that movie so much. Yeah. Uh, this is another odd one for me that I really like. Um, Life of Pi. Ooh. Okay, I love the cinematography in that movie. And I'm not a religious person and I still found this thing eminently watchable. Um, I love I love just every part of it. Um, and I think it's better than the book, actually. <laughs> I mean, it's the Ang Lee effect, right? He's just incredible. Oh, yeah. When he when he hits, he hits hard. Yeah. Like sometimes he has some some movies that don't hit as hard, but you let him do a drama, you got it. I'm gonna take uh, Boyhood for my third. Huh. I love I, man watching that movie really hit me hard so i'm taking boyhood so i'm gonna take one that i i really love and that's once upon a time once upon a time in hollywood oh okay i I, I honestly think it's tarantino's best movie uh we haven't seen the critic you know it's coming out but i this one feels more mature in a way than the other ones did oh my god okay um there's so many good ones here i know they're great let's oh well you know what? I do don't it, care. Do money, it, money do ball, it. money ball. Oh, money ball. I thought you could go somewhere else, bro. Like, I'm sorry to say bro, but money balls infinitely rewatchable and just brilliantly scripted. And the performances are incredible. And so, yeah, I'm taking that. I'm yeah. taking money ball. Okay. So I have one more pick. I mean, I got two heavy hitters here and I, I'm like, okay, I'm going to take it out. I'm going to take it out. Oh, uh, that, that was up there for me. Yeah. yeah and the thing with get out, um it's recognized as a great movie it is a great movie um and i don't think it's in danger of disappearing anytime soon uh but i just want to call it out that you should go watch it all right well i'm gonna take so uh, i'm gonna take black Klansman. i probably would have taken black Klansman over get out but mm, i remember good. watching black Klansman and just i don't know i i think washington is incredible in it i think adam driver is really good and it has this really great energy to it and I was actually kind of hoping it would win Black Klansman. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's a very good movie. Yeah, Topher Grave. Topher yeah. Grace, <laughs> real good. Uh, Mark, I cried in the theater watching that movie. Yeah, it's... It, 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 I don't... To like, give you context, like, never happened before. <laughs> There's something about the energy of it that yeah. just really got me. And Oh, this is an interesting list. So we have Winter's Bone, Mad Max, Rear Road, Life of Pi, One Spot Time in Hollywood, and Get Out. Mm-hmm. I have Tree of Life, Drive My Car, Boyhood, Moneyball. And Black Klansman. I did not pick Top Gun Maverick, even though I wanted to real bad. Because <laughs> I made a billion. Like, it felt like cheating a little bit. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to lose, but I'm very happy with my picks. So I'm I'm very happy. Because I, I don't know. I, I'm, you know, at the end of the day, I don't mind losing if I love my team. Yeah, I get it. There's a lot of great ones on here that I wanted to pick. I almost picked Black Klansman as well. Uh, I went back and forth. Um, I got my first think... pick, though, so I'm happy. Good. Uh Mark, this has been a ton of fun. Yeah, this is great. And yeah, like just enjoy this. I'm glad y'all listened to it, David. I'm glad you brought your expertise. And I feel good. I feel like a weight's off my shoulders. And so uh, that was great. So, hey, where can people find you before we get out of here? Yeah, so I am on all of the uh, various social medias at It's Me, David Cross. I'm mostly on Twitter. You'll find me talking about movies and writing. I, I write fiction. And I'm also a co-host of Award Wieners, where we, we do podcast about each best picture winner and go through the 
basically how they won and like the movie itself. It's a infrequent podcast. So we only do a couple of year. Uh, essentially, when you got to watch 30 to 40, 40 hours of movies, it's a lot. Uh, and that's one of the things I always tell people who are like getting into the Oscars. It's like, it's a lot and it's very heavy. <laughs> and there's a lot of them that you might not like as well, especially the older ones. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, but I, it, a lot of facts. You're going to learn a lot. And you're going to have a great time. So check out the Award Wieners Movie Review Podcast. Well, so, hey, thank you for joining me, David. Thank you, Mark. This has been a blast. All right. So for me, Mark Hoffmeyer, for David Cross, this is Movie Films of Flicks. We'll see you next week.